is, do we have, uh, can, you, can you tell us some steps, concrete steps other than, than the bootstrapping that we would, would be able to take as just homeowners? Yeah, and you know, it's, um, on one level, of course, landscaping is very complex. And on another level, it's really not. And there are some basic steps that you can just walk through and end up with a sustainable landscape. And the very first step, is really a fun one and that's just doing what we're doing now hanging out on your land and getting to know it better because most people live on their properties for years whether it's a little tract house or a big place like you have and they never really take the time to get to know where they are to get to know what the soil type is how the sun moves in the sky where the water goes when it rains all of these elements and you know in the old days in the ancient days the Japanese garden designers who designed for the emperors way back in medieval Japan uh, I understand that they were told to sit on the property for one year, full cycle of seasons, spring, summer, fall, winter, watch the sun come up, watch it go down every day, watch how the birds fly through the area, listen to the sounds, notice what the trees do, and only at the end of that year were they able and qualified to un and understood that land well enough to actually make a design. Wow. Yeah, really interesting. Wow. It's kind of like the sushi chef in Japan where they clean fish for three years and then they finally get to make sushi or maybe cut a fish. You know, they, that's, that's part of their culture is doing everything in the, in the most intricate, best possible way. And so this deep understanding of the land is very important. Now, if it's your own house, you can actually do that for a year. You might not be able to sit there every day, but you can observe cautiously, carefully, and attentively what's going on on your property throughout at least one cycle of seasons, and then you'll begin to really understand it better than any landscape designer who could ever come onto that property. So I have a thing that I call the world's best design tool, and it's in my book, and I always ask my audiences, what's the world's best design tool when you're doing a, a landscape design? And people say, oh, um, you know, um, a measuring tape, a camera, whatever. No, that's not it. It's a chair. It's what we're sitting in right now. What do you do with that chair? You sit down in it, and you don't have your friends over, and you don't bring your iPad, and you don't do any of that stuff. You just do what we don't do in our culture too much, is just relax and let it all happen. And if you've ever done this, you know that it's absolutely amazing what happens, because you start to notice things that you never noticed before. Maybe you've been on your property for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and all of a sudden you realize, wow, there's a tree in the distance that's really beautiful, or the, there's really a lot of noise coming from my, my neighbor's property, and I'd like to do something about that. All sorts of things will start to flow in. And then you begin to get a better feeling for both where you are, what the land needs, what the space needs, and what you need from it, which is very important too, because you've got to remember that we're doing this for ourselves first and foremost. And so you begin then while you're sitting, or even better yet, after you're sitting, because the sitting should, I think, just be sitting. You should just be quiet. And then get a clipboard and a piece of paper and start writing things down. Uh, what did you notice? What did you see? What are the problems on your land? What are the issues that you have? What do you want from it? What do you expect to get? Because remember, there's a key question here. In fact, this is so important. Let me just take a minute to say this. Most landscapes are designed only for how they look. They're purely uh, decorative. They're gingerbread around the house. So, you know, some people said it's the art of hiding ugly houses with ugly plants. Well, maybe. But the point is this. The point is this. If you're not asking what that landscape does, and you're just asking what it looks like, you're not asking the right questions. You start with what it does. We'll get to what it looks like later, which, by the way, sustainable landscaping is at least as beautiful as regular landscaping. It's not cactus and gravel, right? Yes. This has proven it to me. It's yeah. I mean, we're here. We are right. Is this ugly? No. This is this um, is this is one of the most gorgeous landscapes I've had a chance to visit in many many years. We're sitting under a tree called mountain mahogany. It's a California native plant. It's native to right here. I planted it from a one gallon container in 1981. It's been pruned about five times in the last 30 years and it requires zero water and zero care other than just a little bit of pruning to take some deadwood out of it once in a while. It's a fantastic example of a plant that not only looks good, but it does something and it does it at a very low cost. And that's really the heart of sustainable landscaping. Function, minimal impacts, 
minimal inputs of water and fertilizer and all that, in fact, zero on this tree, and minimal or zero outputs of green waste and pollution and spraying, drifting off and all that stuff, okay? So we've got a landscape now made up of things like this, elements like this, whether they're the hardscape, which is the built end of the environment, the plantings, the irrigation system, they all perform a function. Remember, we're talking about an ecosystem here. They actually do something. And when we ask that core question, what is the landscape going to do? What's it going to do for me? And what's it going to do internally for itself? What's it going to do for the environment? What's it going to do for the community? What's it going to do for the birds? What's it going to do for the wildlife? And we answer all those questions. I can pretty much guarantee you that the landscape automatically will also look beautiful. Okay, doesn't mean you automatically know how to design a beautiful landscape, but once you get function down and you ask the right questions, the beauty will come because you're selecting things that are appropriate for, for where you are. So these are the core things that you begin with is a deep understanding of where you are and what is needed to be done here and how does it function? What does it do? That's where you begin. Now, when you move beyond that and you get to the next step, which is actually designing the landscape, that's a little more complicated because we've got our core information, but now we have to turn it into something. And that's where most people really get kind of bogged down because they think, well, I'm not a designer. I don't know how to do this. And, and in some cases, that's probably true. You may not be capable of tackling the entire project. I think one of the important things is to know when to call a professional or to know when to get a good book on the subject, such as, for example, uh, you might guess this, Sustainable Landscaping for Dummies, which has been acclaimed as one of the best books on the subject. Now, in my book, I don't go into deep amounts of detail on design, but it's a good start. And there are lots of other design books that will give you even more detail. And of course, those are easy to find pretty much anywhere. There are a lot of principles to design, uh, both aesthetically and functionally, and how to do things. And it, yes, it is very complicated. It would be a good idea, once you know where you're coming from on this and what you need, to call in a landscape professional, which would be a licensed landscape architect, a landscape designer, or a landscape contractor whose job it is to create landscapes out of a baseline of ideas like this. And then you can work with their ideas and maybe fill in on your own and work together as a collaborative process. Oh, and uh, I was a landscape contractor, and I know people that are still landscape contractors. and. Um, I have a hard time believing that there are a lot of sustainable landscapers out there. They're much more interested in charging $135 a month to spray and then another $100 a month to fertilize. Um, you've already shown me that that's $250 a month wasted. Uh, where do I find somebody that, that, that can actually help me? It's a good question. We're, we're in a transition right now between the era, uh, if you will, of conventional landscaping, that uh, high conflict adversarial horticulture, and a brand new world of sustainable landscaping. And someday, not too long from now, hopefully it will all be sustainable because frankly, we can't afford to do this stuff anymore. So what's happening in the professions is that people, some people, not all people, and you're right, most of, of the, the professions are still locked to the past and they're doing things the old way. But there's a huge number of people who are retraining themselves and I get Google alerts every day on sustainable landscaping and I can see where this is going. There are people in every community in this country, in Canada and elsewhere who are learning these techniques and who are becoming adept at this stuff. So it's actually becoming easier to find someone who's a trained professional. There are organizations like the Ecological Landscaping Association, which is made up of landscape professionals who are totally committed really? to doing things in a sustainable way. They're dead serious about it. They mean business. And th we're all learning these skills. This is all new. So none of us really know everything. I don't know everything. I don't know anybody who does know everything. But there are people out there who are very, very committed to this process. So finding those people um, can sometimes be challenging. You could start with Ecological Landscaping Association as an example, um, and interviewing people and asking some core questions about what they plan to do. If they're telling you that um, you know they want bare ground and um, overhead sprinklers and they don't believe in drip and they want to put in a lot of high water use plants and tons of lawn, that's probably not your sustainable landscaper. That's not the guy or girl or woman who's going to really be able to pull this off. 
This is a special new set of skills that we're learning. Is it possible that uh, you could supply us with a, a list of references where we could start looking that we could sure. make available? To Absolutely. You? And, and you. people, organizations, books, videos, everything. Um, what we're doing in this series is trying to be encyclopedic and expand people's awareness and give people the basics of how to make this all happen. So this will all unfold as we continue our conversation and I'll certainly be happy to um, make everything available to viewers um, that there is out there because we need all the information. And I think once you f find that once you begin to actually learn this and process this and get involved, it's so much fun, it's so much more interesting than that old lawn and turf which was so boring. You're just gonna get drawn into this in a really nice way and you realize, why didn't I do this 20 years ago? Well, it didn't really exist 20 years ago. Here we are, brand new world. You can be part of this. Um, there's nothing mysterious about it. It's basically about doing things right. Thank you so much.